today my talk is going to be about uh, polycurve nets, activation free neural networks for efficient private inference. But before I go into my talk, my name is Karthik Nandakumar. I'm an associate professor at Mohammed bin Zayed University of Artificial Intelligence. For those of you who are not aware of uh, this university, this is a new uh, university focused purely on AI research, right? It's located in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates, and we are aggressively expanding. So if you are looking for opportunities, please feel free to reach out to me. Okay, uh, so this work was mainly done by a master student, Tolwani. So he could not be here because of visa issues. So I'm presenting it on his behalf. So why are we interested in private inference? Right? Machine learning as a service is growing uh, rapidly. So you have many organizations trying to train larger and larger neural network models, and then um, basically use this as a monetization platform, right? So deploy these models on a cloud so that people who don't have the data, who don't have the resources to build these models can use these large models, get inferences on the data. So this is a rapidly growing field with many um, big organizations like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, everybody is jumping in onto this kind of platforms. But the issue is in many practical scenarios, the user cannot send the data to the cloud service provider. Right. The reason is because of sensitive issue, sensitivity issues, privacy issues. There are legal uh, complications like GDPR regulations that you cannot send the data out to any organization uh, without users consent. Right. So basically, although machine learning as a service has been promoted aggressively by these tech companies and by different market players, it is not catching up because of all these privacy issues. And one potential solution to solve this problem is uh, kind of encryption or private inference, right? So the idea is somehow you encrypt the data, send it to the service provider. The service provider purely works on encrypted data, gets uh, inference, which is also encrypted. So the uh, service provider sees nothing. So the result comes back to the user. The user can decrypt and you use the prediction result. Right? So that's the main idea behind private inference. And two main cryptographic solutions are available to enable this kind of private, uh, private inference. So one is called a secure multi-party computation. Uh, in this case, it's especially only two parties because there's only a model owner and a data owner. So the data owner is sending, uh, the information is exchanged between these two entities, right? So it's essentially uh, a two-party kind of computation. Okay, the other solution is called as fully homomorphic encryption where the user encrypts the data and the model owner directly acts on this encrypted data. But in both these kind of cryptographic solutions, there is a fundamental problem, which is they are diametrically opposite to the requirements of machine learning. As you all know, um, for the last 10 years, deep learning models have become deeper and deeper. So you have large models, which are, have so many layers, and you need to do a lot of sequential computations in order to get the result, right? Whereas these cryptographic protocols kind of hate these kind of sequential computations. And the second problem is most of these networks also have um, layers such as nonlinear activation and pooling layers, without which the model just collapses into a linear uh, case, right? So without these nonlinear activations, you cannot get good accuracy. But uh, it is very difficult to implement these nonlinear operations in the cryptographic domain. Okay, so both multi-party computation and FHE they try to avoid nonlinearity as much as possible because that's the main bottleneck in the computation. And two main solutions have been proposed to address this problem. So one solution is, okay, I know that nonlinearity is an issue. So I try to reduce my nonlinearity as much as possible. So which is what I call as constrained nonlinearity. So essentially you have a lot of work um, starting with a paper called CryptoNAS, which is crypto, cryptographic neural architecture search. It's basically trying to try get neural network architectures which have the least amount of nonlinearity, but still they have good performance, right? And they propose various mechanisms such as, okay, I move some layers forward and backward to reduce the number of nonlinear computations. Sometimes I prune some computations which are not required and so on, right? So you have various methods to uh, constrain your neural network to a particular ReLU budget. Um, so ReLU is one of the most popular nonlinear activation functions used. The other approach is, okay, uh, Nonlinear operations are difficult, so maybe I just approximate them using simpler polynomials, right? So polynomial approximation is the other approach. But the problem with both these approaches are that they lead to significant accuracy versus efficiency trade-off. 
So if you remove too many activation functions, then your accuracy drops significantly, but you need to remove a lot of activations in order to uh, improve your uh, efficiency. Right. Similarly, when the, in the case of polynomial approximation, if you go for simpler and simpler polynomials, let's say a degree two quadratic or, uh, or a degree three polynomial, you basically um, increasing the error, uh, error propagation. So you lose accuracy, but then you gain efficiency. And the other issue is this constraint non linearity which is the ReLU budget thing works only in the case of multi-party computation, where you have mechanisms such as uh, garbled circuits in order to allow at least some nonlinear computations. Whereas in the FHE domain, you cannot do any nonlinearity. So you have to rely on polynomial approximation. So that's the only solution available. So our whole paper is based on this concept called curvolutional neural networks. So when we are searching for a solution, we chanced upon this paper in CVPR 2019. So the main idea which they propose is typically in a convolutional neural network, you do a convolution operation, which is basically a linear operation. You can represent it as an inner product, right? Um, so what the, this paper, uh, Curvolutional Neural Networks proposes is that they introduce something called curvolution. Essentially, it's like if you do a transformation of your features and the weights, the nonlinear transformation, and then you represent this nonlinear transformation using a kernel function, using the kernel trick, right? So it's like computing a linear operation and then applying a nonlinear kernel, okay? So this kind of combines both linear operations, which is the convolution and the nonlinear activation into one single function, okay? So that's the main idea behind curvolutional neural networks. And in that paper, there are many possible options are provided for curvolutional uh, operator. So things like norm-based operations, polynomial operations, and Gaussian curvolution were introduced. Um, so in this paper on curvolutional neural networks, the authors just stopped at replacing some of the convolutional layers with curvolution operators, right? So they did not, they were just using curvolution as a replacement for some of the convolutions or to enhance some of the convolutions. They did briefly discuss about using this curvolution as a replacement for, uh, let's say, nonlinear activation, right? Removing the ReLUs and then using only curvolution instead of using convolution plus ReLU, okay? But then uh, they did very limited work. I mean, they left uh, this for future work, like how to design neural networks using purely curvolution without uh, any activation functions. So our main contribution in this paper is we, we kind of identify the synergy between these polynomial curvolutional neural networks, which we call as poly curve nets, and the requirements for private inference. Okay, so these polynomial curvolutions can be computed in the encrypted domain. Um, they seem to work reasonably well. At the same time, um, they are implementable using um, cryptographic protocols. So with this, I, after identifying the synergy, we basically looked at various convolutional neural network op op uh, architectures and then try to uh, redesign them using this curvolution operator. So you will see some of the variations that we have tried later. So basically our key conclusions are that these poly coordinates, they minimize accuracy loss in the case of FHA implementation. So they are better than polynomial approximations in that sense. And they also minimize the latency uh, in the case of constrained nonlinearity. Okay, so this is how uh, we designed a few of these networks. So let's say the first uh, architecture that we tried is called as poly curve rest nets. So what we essentially did is take, took a rest net 18 architecture. It starts with the uh, convolution layer at the beginning. Of course, after every convolution, there's a batch normalization layer and a ReLU layer, which is the activation function. And then there are multiple residual blocks, what they call as residual blocks, right? And in each residual block, you have a convolution operator, actually two convolution operators, each followed by batch norm and ReLU, and then you have a residual connection. And you kind of repeat these blocks multiple times in order to design the whole ResNet architecture, okay? So what we did is, okay, we have this given ResNet architecture. Let's see what happens if we just replace every convolution with the curvolution operator and remove all the nonlinear activations, right? So there's no ReLU in this network. So you, every convolution is just replaced by curvolution, right? So that gives you, uh, what we call as poly curve ResNet 18 architecture, which is very similar to the original ResNet 18 architecture, is just that all the convolutions and the ReLU are replaced by poly curvolution, polynomial curvolution, okay? Then we also tried other variations. Basically what happens if you reduce the number of residual blocks? 
So instead of uh, repeating this residual, having four residual blocks or repeating this residual block four times, we kind of repeat it only two times or three times. So that gives us uh, different variations of this architecture, uh, which we call as PKR10 and PKR14. So we also tried other variations, right? So we saw that there are two convolution operations within each residual block. What happens um, if we just replace one of them with a curvolution and one replace the, I mean, retain the convolution in the other one. So that one we call as mixed polycurvenets. We also tried removing one convolution altogether, just replacing it with one curvolution. So we call that as polycurvenet small. So these are different variations of the same architecture. And we also tried the same kind of approach with other kinds of CNN networks like VGG16, AlexNet, Lenet, and so on. So moving on to the results, the first thing we looked at is how, how do these polycurvenets compare in terms of accuracy with respect to the other competing methods, right? The first row here shows the vanilla ResNet 18, which is it includes all the ReLU activations. So that gives you good accuracy in many of these data sets, which we are considered like the first data set is uh, a chest x ray data set for tuberculosis uh, direction. And then we have the regular CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100 data sets. Okay. Uh, the second row is the deep reduced model, which is, work is works on a ReLU budget, right? It tries to reduce the number of nonlinear activations. So this deep reduced model actually produces very good accuracy. So we can reduce um, at least half of the ReLUs and still get reasonably good accuracy, not just reasonably, it's sometimes even better than the original rested model, right? So you get good accuracy. Um, so the other polynomial approximations don't work well. So we try different approximations proposed in the literature, which we call as poly approx one, two, and the square activation, which is just replacing the ReLU with the square function. And finally, in the last row, we have this PKR18, which is the poly curve rest net, uh, which we have proposed. Okay, so if you see carefully our, uh, our poly curve nets, has slightly lower accuracy compared to, let's say, the deep reduced model. Um, but then we will see later that uh, even though they are marginally reduced, marginally less accuracy, they are more efficient in the uh, private inference evaluation. So we also looked at uh, how do these different variations that we tried uh, work, right? So let's say on the CIFAR 10 data set, when we try to reduce the number of layers, surprising the performance improved significantly, right? Or uh, at least a reasonable amount. So for the PKR18, you have 91% accuracy, 90.1% accuracy. If you reduce a couple of residual blocks, the PKR10 had almost 92% accuracy, okay? Even though it has, it is a much shallower network and it has fewer parameters, um, the accuracy improved. And the main reason we found that the accuracy was improving is because reducing the number of layers improves the training stability. So one of the main role of the nonlinear activation function uh, in a neural network is to improve the stability of the training process. So when you remove these ReLUs and then try to train the network, the network, uh, the convergence is a big issue, right? But when you make the networks shallower, it's somewhat, it becomes somewhat more easier, right? So basically shallower networks are mostly easy to train. And because of this uh, increase in the training stability, you get better accuracy. But then this is true only for simpler problems on a CIFAR 10 kind of data set. If you move to CIFAR 100 data set, uh, you don't have that luxury of reducing the number of layers. So if you reduce the number of layers, um, the accuracy drops uh, significantly, right? So we are stuck with uh, at least a ResNet 18 kind of model uh, for a CIFAR 100 data set. So in this graph, we show, um, the, the x-axis here is the multiplicative depth, which is basically showing the depth of the, the depth of the model itself. And then uh, on the y-axis, here, the top one accuracy. So here we are comparing different kinds of architectures, uh, including Lenet, uh, AlexNet, VGG16, and ResNet, different versions of ResNet. And then we are also looking at different kinds of approximations, like the polynomial approximation, the square activation, and our proposed method, which is polycurvenet. So we see that the polycurvenet for any given multiplicative depth, right? So if you fix the depth of the network, we always achieve better kind of accuracy compared to the other approximations. And even among these different architectures, the ResNet 10 architecture seems to perform much better uh, in the case of the CIFAR 10 data set, okay? And the reason, uh, all, even in other cases, the ResNet architecture performs better because of these residual connections. So again, it ties back to the, um, issue of training stability. So having these residual connections somehow 
helps you to improve the straining stability, improves the convergence. And that's why this residual architecture seem to work better compared to uh, the other architectures such as VGG or AlexNet. So next, uh, we show some results for the private inference evaluation. So here we are first looking at uh, the two-party computation protocols. We looked at two different frameworks called uh, Delphi and Cheetah. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, the deep reduce, which is a ReLU reduction framework that has a very good accuracy, but then the improvement in the latency, right? So it, compared to the vanilla case where you have the nonlinear activations is only uh, two times, right? So you're basically reducing half the computations, okay? You can go and aggressively eliminate a lot more ReLUs, right? But then that will significantly drop your accuracy in the case of deep reduce. But in our case, uh, we get a slightly lower accuracy. Let's say we are sacrificing almost 1% in terms of accuracy, but then we get an order of magnitude improvement in terms of latency. So our poly net is roughly around uh, 10, well, at least 10 times faster than uh, deep reduce, the corresponding deep reduce method. So we have also tried evaluation with FHE methods. Uh, specifically, we use the uh, HE layers framework to implement the CKKS encryption scheme, which is one of the most well-known FHE uh, schemes which, are being, which is being used currently. And we show that reasonable accuracy can be obtained uh, with uh, at least good latency. So the, here, if you see the different approximations, the polynomial approximations, all of them have similar latency because everything uh, is kind of using a degree two polynomial, but then the proposed method achieves better accuracy compared to the existing approximations. So we also did some ablation studies to test the impact of different hyperparameters. So here are the two main hyperparameters are the polynomial degree, which we use in the curvolution operator and the balance factor. Uh, so we find that using the polynomial degree of two usually works well and the balance factor of uh, between 0 0.5 and one works quite well. And we also tried uh, another approach of knowledge distillation. So instead of training the network from scratch, what happens if you al already have a pre-trained network and then you try to distill the knowledge from this pre-trained network into this FHE friendly models that you are training. And that seems to improve quite a bit on the accuracy. For example, if you start with a um, state-of-the-art ResNet 18 model on this uh, CIFAR 10 data set, which has 93.6% accuracy, uh, after distillation, we get reasonably good accuracy, almost 93.4%. But then it has little impact on the model's hyperparameters. To basically summarize, these poly polynomial curve nets um, without activation functions are very suitable for doing private inference. The main problem is the training stability, right? So you need to design the network architecture such that um, you get proper training uh, convergence going on, okay? And the, some of the key lessons that we learned are, you need to use the minimal depth required for the task at hand. Um, use of residual connections usually helps in the training process. And most of the times polynomial degree two is sufficient and distillation from a well-trained teacher model is usually uh, gives you better performance. Yeah, so with this, I conclude my talk and be happy to answer any questions.